I've entitled the message, From the Dust of the Earth, and you'll see that in the text of Scripture that we're going to read from Genesis in just a moment. I have been a pastor here for about three years, but I have been in vocational ministry. I've been a pastor somewhere since 2002, so over 22 years now. In that time, I have done many funerals. I've done probably in the slower years that I've been doing this, maybe two a year, but sometimes it can go as many as five a year. So you start doing the math. It's been quite a few services that I've done, whether we're talking uh, uh, something at the funeral home, something here at the church building, or the graveside committal. Actually, the very first one I ever did was still when I was an assistant pastor, and the senior pastor I was working with thought it would be a good experience. Somebody had called up the church, uh, and their father or grandfather had died uh, during the winter, but they wanted to put his body in the ground uh, during the springtime after the, the ground had softened. He had died in Florida, but wanted to be buried in Iowa. So that was my very first service. I'd never met this family, had the opportunity, though, to talk about some of the things, even like we're going to talk about here. And so when you include things like that, the committals, the graveside services, I have officiated funerals in six different states, in Iowa, Minnesota, where I've been here now for three years, but was on the other part of the state for 10 years, in Illinois, in Missouri, in Maine, and in South Dakota, from when I had some members in my church in Minnesota on the other side of the state wanting to be buried in the family plot right across the border. And in those different situations, I've had the different opportunity to lay to rest many older people, older saints who have reached the end of their life and gone on to heaven to be with the Lord. But I've also had the other extreme, probably the most extreme, is I've had to do two funerals for babies who didn't quite reach birth. There was one service where the mother found out a week before her due date uh, that her child had not survived. And that's, that's so hard. That's so weighty on a family. And at the same time, when a Christian comes together, when a group of Christians come together to grieve, we feel the sorrow. We feel the weight of it. But these are words that I often say as we're concluding the service, just before they get ready to lower the casket into the ground. They're not original with me, and you maybe you've heard this at some other service, or you've seen a service portrayed in a movie or on a film somewhere, and they will often say these words, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother, and then they put the name in, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious unto him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Amen. That, those phrases, those sentences, those words have been spoken many times. But what you hear there, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, is familiar, but it is not directly taken from Scripture. But it does allude very clearly to something that is very biblical. It is a concept that we see rooted here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 with the first Adam. But it also anticipates the hope made possible by the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the man from heaven, which you'll also see that phrase occur in the passage we're going to read in just a moment. So let's begin with Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Then we turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and beginning in verse 42 there. The Apostle Paul making reference to some of these things that we're reading about in Genesis. By the way, if you're not regularly here with us, we are, first of all, very glad you chose to join us today on this day where we remember the resurrection of Jesus. 
we are preaching normally, and we started this at the very first of January, uh, the first Sunday in January, we are going through the book of Genesis. So we aren't going very fast. We've only made it up to chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, but what we have understood here is that Genesis lays the foundation as God makes the world and everything in it for why ultimately Jesus would have to come. And what we're talking about here this morning is God breathes breath into Adam. That there's also some things there that lay the groundwork for why Jesus would have to come. And this is what we read about as we understand Paul explains it to the people he's writing to in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Beginning in verse 42, it says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the man of heaven. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us so that we might know what to believe, so that we might know how to live, and then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. And that's whose day we remember today. So may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You can look again on the back of that paper, or uh, if you scan the QR code, you'll be able to follow along as we work our way through this passage. But what we're understanding is, first of all, God made us from the dust of the earth, and God made all of us. We're saying God made humanity. The picture there of the two hands, maybe you've seen that picture I think it's Da Vinci, uh, where he has the creation of man. You have God in big robes on a cloud, and he's reaching down, uh, pointing out his finger to touch Adam, and he's there on the ground. And it's, he's trying to picture, personify, imagine for us what that might have been like for God to create Adam, for God to create mankind. He formed him from the dust of the ground, is what we read in the text of Scripture. Nobody was there to see it. God is giving Moses those details so he can record them for our benefit. Adam, the man, was formed, and the Hebrew word for ground, for dust, is Adama. It is, Adam is made from this. It's like dust and dust boy, you know, <laughs> if we want to think of it that way. He's trying to help them understand in their original language that he came from something that we can see, we can experience, we can identify with, and ultimately, when we die, we break back down into. We know what composting is, and we know what happens to bodies when they die. They break down and become, again, part of the dirt. That is also the reality of that is because of the consequences of our sin. We return to the ground. If you have your Bible open to Genesis, you can look a, few ch uh, a chapter ahead in a few verses to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. The reason why we have this curse, this death that we all face, the reason why I've had to preach now probably 50-some funerals over the course of my 22 years in ministry is because of what God tells Adam after they have disobeyed. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Because that happened to Adam, Paul tells us that's what happens to all of us as well. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul writes this, Just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, 
and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all of us have sinned. We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but right now we're focusing on the reality of all of us, the universality of all of us facing the reality of death. The biblical worldview, the Christian story, helps us understand how we got to this point. And it was not God's intention that we would be at this point. It is because Adam disobeyed. It is because Adam sinned. And this is what happens to our bodies. In other verses, if you want to read about breaking it down, you can read Genesis 18.27. Abraham says, I am but dust and ashes. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and to the dust all return. Anybody watch baseball? It's opening day this week. Anybody watch the Twins? I think Joey was talking to me. You were watching the Twins this week, weren't you, Joey? Let's go Twins. Anybody, any Twins fans here? I guess we're all watching basketball right now, right? It's, it's the March Madness and things. Well, I was doing a little research. My team is not the Twins. I, I don't root against the Twins. We all hate the Yankees, but I'm a Red Sox fan, right? So, so we, we have something in common anyway. <laughs> but one of the players that I grew up with in the early 1990s, he didn't, he, wasn't ever, he didn't ever quite achieve his potential, was a player by the name of Sam Horn. He, he, he grew up through the ranks in the farm system, and he was going to be good. And I think he had a couple of good seasons. Eventually, he went over to play in Taiwan and played for the Baltimore Orioles when they weren't very good. Uh, And so he has, though, something named after him. It's probably not the kind of thing you want to be named. Here's the story. In baseball, a horn is when a player strikes out six times in a game. (laughs) And so when he was playing for the Baltimore Orioles, one of his teammates, Mike Flanagan, who was a pitcher for the team, told that that after he had struck out, Sam Horn struck out six times in a game in 1991 during an extra inning games. And Flanagan tells reporters that six strikeouts would thereafter be known as a horn. And he said, if if somebody can do this, if they can strike out seven times, we'll call it a horn of plenty. (laughs) And now if you look in the baseball record books, certainly, sure enough, somebody every year has made sure that if that record is being held, they refer to it as somebody getting a horn. I think there's actually been two other people since then who have achieved that ignominious record. So that's not something you exactly want to have. We want to be the greatest of all time. We want to be the first. We want to be the best. What does that have to do with what we're talking about? Adam is the first Adam. But he's not really known in the case of what we're talking about, comparing him to Jesus as being the best, is he? In in fact, he's the one who sinned. He's the one who messed up. He's the one who's responsible for the situation we're all in. But here's what we also have. Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. He's the true and better Adam. He's the one who helps us when we follow after him and not our first father, we can experience that transforming power, that change. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It has the power to change you. That gospel, that is a word that means good news. That is a word that means that we can be different. We don't have to be in the position where we currently are of being trapped with the consequences of our sin, facing the certainty of death, to identify, to believe in the good news that Jesus brings means that we can have forgiveness, means that we can have salvation. We can be transformed through what Jesus has done. That return to the dust is not permanent. The hope that we can look for is not just a transformation in this life now, which God wants us to have. We need to be looking more and more like Jesus, resembling him in our thoughts, in our actions, in our activity. But we also read in 1 Corinthians 15, where we read earlier, if you keep going down the chapter, he gives us this promise in verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That is, there's something that's going to happen to this body. That's what he was talking about earlier in the passage where he says there's a natural body, what we have now, and there's something better coming. There's a spiritual body. More about that in a moment. But what we see in this passage is that God formed Adam. Jesus can transform us. God gave Adam life. That's next on your outline. And God gives us life through Jesus. In Genesis chapter 2, God gives humanity life and breath. Human life, according to the Bible, is more than just the animation. It's more than just us breathing. We know that there are other creatures out there. I have a few dogs at home. My daughter's here visiting for Easter. We have four dogs at home again, people, <laughs> for some of you who are following our, our dog trajectory. And that's okay. We're, we're, we're looking forward to that. But at the same time, we know animals breathe. They have that respiration capacity within them. So when Genesis 2 says that God breathed into humanity the breath of life, it's more than just being able to take in oxygen and to go through the respiration system. What we read about in Genesis 2-7, that word in our English Bible that's translated the breath of life, that is the Hebrew word nashema, nashema, and that has to do with more than just oxygen. Some places in the Old Testament translate that word as spirit, and so there's more that comes with that than just oxygen, although that's part of it. It's life, but in Job 32 verse 8, if you have that sheet, you can look down and see this verse. Job says, it is the spirit of man, this breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. So what God gives to Adam is more than just breathing. There is an intellectual capacity to understand right, to understand what his relationship with God is. There's a spiritual comprehension that makes us different from the animals. It's what maybe we would refer to earlier in the Genesis passage where it's describing creation, where God says that we are created in God's image. There is a moral likeness that comes into it. And that's what he's investing in Adam. We would also say that that aspect of what God has given humanity results in us having consciences. For example, it says in Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit or that breath that God puts in Adam of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. That is, God lights our understanding and helps us know, helps us be sensitive to what it is he wants us to do. But Adam had that within him and chose to rebel against that conscience. He committed sin. He disobeyed God's command, and that resulted in him being cast out of the garden. It resulted in death. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, which we've also already read, says this again, just as sin came into the world through one man. There it is again with Adam. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Because of what Adam did, and because of what we do, we have been given life, but we have also lost that life. But Jesus comes to give us eternal life. Many of you here in the room could quote this verse with me, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but he will have what? Eternal, everlasting life. That's ours because of what Jesus gives to us. In Ephesians chapter 1, the passage is there in that notes. I'm going to take the time to read this. This is a few verses, but he tells us the benefits of what happens to those who put their faith for those who believe in Jesus. And he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption. Through Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth, In Him, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him, in Jesus also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The reality is here, friends, that we have a better life now if we believe, and we have a better life to look forward to after we cease to live in this body, or whether Jesus comes and takes us home before that, That's the reality. We have a new and eternal life to look forward to because of what Jesus gives to us, because He includes us in the Beloved, as it says. We are become a part of His family. The next thing that we read about in 1 Corinthians 15 is that there is a natural body that we have with Adam, and there is a spiritual body. What's that all about? Well, we've already learned that God gave the body of Adam breath. It became a living soul, a living being, a living creature. It was able to start breathing oxygen, but it was also able to start thinking rationally to understand what God wanted him to do. But what we also see in scriptures, Jesus can give us something better. Because humanity messed that up. We have this natural body, and you, many of you already know from firsthand experience, you know the aches and pains. Some of you even now are maybe sitting there with stomachs growling because you were at the end of the line and you didn't get any pancakes or <laughs> something like that. But you know what it means to have a body. It needs to be fed. It needs to use the restroom, which is through the double doors on the left if you need them. <laughs> okay? But... We also know that there's more serious things in that, too. We know that we have aches and pains. I see a few walkers here in the room because people don't have the same kind of mobility that they once had. If I looked around the room and compared it to a few years ago, I'd look next to you and see there's some empty chairs next to you. Maybe I've even done the funeral service for somebody who was important to you or somebody else did that for you. And you feel that emptiness. Some of us maybe even look at those people. Maybe you're even here this morning. We'll say, if that happened to me or that's already happened to me, I don't know what happened to those people. I'm not sure about what he's talking about up there. I don't have that kind of confidence. Friends, this is what Easter Sunday, this is what celebrating the resurrection of Jesus is really all about. It gives us hope. Through Jesus' resurrection, He became the first to have the spiritual body that it talks about in 1 Corinthians 15.44. And that describes how we are going to live in eternity. Paul says in another place in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship, he's talking to people who have already believed in Jesus. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, he says, this natural body that has its aches and pains, that some of us need walkers, some of us are breaking down, some of us are struggling with illnesses, we've lost other people. Jesus is going to take that lowly, natural body 
and change it to be like his glorious body. And how is he going to do that? It says, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He's the, made, he's the one who made the world. So is this going to be too hard for him? He's the one who said, let there be light. And there it was. He's the one who spoke it all into existence. This is not too hard for him. This is what he's made available to you and me. And one day, when we get that spiritual body, when we go on, if you believe in Jesus and go on to the new heaven and the new earth, this is what it tells us will happen. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, Jesus will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things will have passed away. There's hope coming in the future. Think of it. One day, Jesus is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. There's not going to be any death any longer. There's not going to be any pain. There's not going to be any mourning or crying. So folks, I can only conclude that means there's not going to be any election and presidential elections in heaven. And there won't be. As much as that's a lighthearted comment, we will reign with King Jesus. He will be the ruler and the authority, and He will be the perfect leader for us. Because He is the leader who sacrificed Himself. He's not in it for His benefit. He's in it to make sure that we could enter into His kingdom. Friends, this is an objective category at the same time. A natural body and a spiritual body. We can't go to heaven like we are currently. We need Jesus to change us. There's so much talk in today's culture about whatever I happen to be, but it's not what I feel inside. You know, like, I, I, I am this biologically, but I identify as this inside. Without going into a lot of different things this morning, friends, the Bible says there are objective categories, and we can't just get into heaven because we feel like we belong. There's an objective reality for us to embrace, and that has nothing to do with sex or gender or, or all these other things. It has everything to do to recognize that if we are here in our biological descending from Adam state, that's not going to be enough. We're not going to get into heaven that way. We need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We need to trust in the transforming power of the second Adam. So yes, we identify with him, but it's so that he will take us and change us and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, to take us from that state and put us into his state, to make us be like him, to help us embrace the hope and the reality that he conquered death, and so shall we. What we have, friends, all we have to do to experience that hope is to claim that change, to claim what he has offered. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. So if we claim the change, we realize that Adam sinned. He is the one who disobeyed God in the garden. And because of that, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans 3.23. This is a condition that is true for every single person. Psalm 51.5 says, David says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What he's trying to tell us there is not that she did some wrong act that resulted in his conception. He's saying, when I was born, I already had all the capability to sin internally. There have been debates even recently on what does that look like? When does an infant start to sin? I think 
Is, is Calvin Kashu back there? He's, he's here in the building somewhere, isn't he, Anthony? Has he sinned yet? We're, we're not really sure. But theologically, he has that capability. As cute as he is, as innocent as he might seem, he is going to one day know what is right, and he's going to refuse to do it. And it's not because Anthony or Brooke had to teach him. It's because he already possesses that capability and he is going to choose wrong. Not every time. What it's talking about when the Bible says that everyone is a sinner, it's not saying everybody's going to sin as often as they possibly can. But it is saying none of us do right all the time. None of us are consistently, perfectly good. But Jesus never sinned. 1 Peter 2.22 says, Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus to be sin, that is, all the consequences of our sin were put on him who knew no sin. He had never done wrong. So that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. We who were imperfect could be made perfect because what God does with the blood of Jesus is He takes that death, He takes that sacrifice and puts it on us like a robe. He takes off the clothing of our sin and He puts on us the righteousness of Christ. And when God looks down and sees who is part of my family? Who should I let into heaven? And he sees us and not what we have done. He sees instead what Christ has done for us. It's as if we went to court. We were found guilty and we had a fine to pay. We had a sentence to carry out. But the judge comes down and says, I know you're guilty, but you don't have to worry. I've got this covered. And he paid the penalty that we deserve because he includes us into his new family. He makes it as if we are no longer the outsider. We are one of his children because of what Jesus has done for us. Adam sinned. Jesus did not. Adam, because he sinned, would die. But Jesus rose why would Adam die? Because in the garden, God gave Adam a command and a warning. This is what you should do, and this is what's going to happen to you if you don't do it. Genesis 2.16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat, surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." Don't eat of this tree. If you do, there's a consequence. Adam and Eve disobeyed that command. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, Genesis 3, 6, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And because of that, one man and his actions, death through sin, came to us all. But here is what it also says. We've been quoting that verse from Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 a few times this morning. If you go earlier in the passage, here's why we have hope. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, those of us who have believed have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved. And how will we be saved? By his life. Because he rose from the dead, that is what gives us hope. That death is not the end. There is hope in Jesus' resurrection. And that hope, friend, can be yours if you will believe because what Adam does is needs life from God. What Jesus does is supply life from God 
to us. What you read there in Genesis is that Adam wouldn't have had life unless God breathed it into him. He depended on God even after the fall. You see that Adam and Eve still depend on God. They need clothing. God kills animals and gives them skins for clothing. When we see them interacting with uh, Cain and Abel, their children, God is still speaking to them. He's put them out of the garden, but he hasn't abandoned them. They are still dependent on him for their existence. And God promises them a Savior, a Deliverer. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's talking to the serpent there that God is going to send someone to crush the head of the serpent, to crush the head of the one who led them into this sin. That's the Savior that God was foreshadowing, that he was going to send. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Though because of, our, of Adam, we walk in the ways of sin and death, friend, Jesus offers you life. Listen to what he says to Mary and Martha in John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks them, and then I ask you in his voice, do you believe this? Because that is what it must be for the gift to be yours. You must believe. Friend, the point I want you to remember after all the things that we've talked about this morning, starting in Genesis, is you, just like Adam, were made by God. You were made like God. But ultimately, Jesus came so that your life could be for God through all of eternity. He made you. God made you in His image. And He made you to live forever. Adam, and then all of us after, have messed it up. We don't have the perfect relationship with him. But God has made it possible through Jesus and his death on the cross and putting the emphatic step of triumph over death through his resurrection for that relationship to be repaired and restored for us to embrace the reality of eternity. This is what John says in his gospel as we close in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, through Jesus. And yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You can have salvation if you will believe. You remember this, when we started the message this morning, we were talking about funerals, and I gave you the ashes to ashes, the dust to dust. Right before I say that, give a little bit of hope. I read this. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You make known to me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In light of Jesus' triumph over death, in light of the resurrection that we celebrate today, friend, do you have that sure and certain hope? When you die, will I be able to say something like this, or whoever is officiating your funeral, will they be able to say, that the person in that box is just there for a time. There is coming a day where his or her body will rise again.
because the sure and certain hope of salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ is theirs. Can we make your death an opportunity for others to know life? Because Jesus' death means that you can have that. Father, thank you for that hope. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you for that sure certainty that we can have, not because of anything that we can do, not because of how good we have been, but because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. We praise you for your salvation. We thank you for our hope. And we pray that if there is someone here this morning, even now, who is hearing of these things for the first time, that you will work through your word and through your spirit to help them process the reality that Jesus and his salvation can be theirs if they will but believe. We pray, Lord, that you would do that changing work, that transforming work through your word this morning in their lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.